everybody. I am Kathy Salisbury and I'm the director of the Ambler Arboretum of Temple University. Uh, if you can, if you just show me by thumbs up, how many of you have been to the Ambler Arboretum? Uh, you can use the little, uh, I'm trying to find a, the, the little thing. You can show thumbs up, but you can use the little icon. There, uh, there you go. Nancy figured it out. So uh, yeah, there they are. There's some thumbs up coming. So that the the Ambler Arboretum is the 187 acre satellite campus of Temple University, located in Upper Dublin Township on Meeting House Road. So we are a public garden and a um, outdoor classroom and a living laboratory. We are free and open to the public seven days a week from sunrise to sunset. And we encourage you all to, to come and visit. In fact, tomorrow, if anybody's available, we have a, um, a walk, a director's walk, which just are, we have a seasonal director's walk one, once each season that just highlights what's interesting and going on in the Arboretum at the time. So that is happening on Friday. And then Saturday, we actually have a program called the Science of Scary, where you can bring your family here and we talk about, and we have guests speaking about all the things in science that people might be scared of. Um, so from lightning to skunks and sharks and mushrooms or spiders, whatever it might be. So um, that also is free. And we just encourage you to, to register ahead of time, but that's going on from two to four on Saturday. So we hope that you that we will see you there. The walk is at noon tomorrow. <clears throat> it goes from noon to one-ish. Um, trying to get better at the ish, but that's the way it usually works out. So noon to one is a lunchtime walk. So today I thought I'd talk to you about uh, putting your gardens to bed. This might be a little bit late for some of you. You might've already started doing these tasks, but I would ask you, if you don't mind in the chat, if you could write down some of the tasks you've already done or the things you're thinking about doing as we head into the fall season in the garden. So you could just type in some of the things in the chat box. I'll give you a minute or two to do that. Oh, so for the temple walk, we meet at the, the flagpole in front of Bright Hall, the circle in front of Bright Hall. So if you just walk in across from Meeting House Road and keep walking straight up past the barn, you'll see it. But see if anybody has some tasks that they're looking to do in their fall garden. And if you hear noises around me, they are doing, um, they're replacing the heater, the heating system in our offices today. So there's um, noises, construction and things. Cleaning the hostas, pruning roses, tying up hydrangeas, trimming bushes, good. Cleaning the hostas. The deer don't clean the hostas for you? That's nice, the deer clean our hostas for us. Trimming bushes, all right. So some pruning going on, some cleaning up going on. Cut down the dead flowers, leave the ones that might recede. Nets over the shrubs that the deer like, okay. So keeping a uh, critter management in mind. Ornamental grasses, <laughs> how to tend to the skip laurels. Um, when to cut tall ornamental grasses. Okay, some questions, that's good. All right, good. So, um, so what we're gonna talk about today is what's going on in your garden in the fall and the types of tasks that you might consider as you are going uh, to work in your fall garden or enjoying your fall garden. So the a lot of people do a fall cleanup. And this is something that the garden centers and agways and tractor supplies um, and commercials at Home Depot and Lowe's and all of that stuff talk to you about is getting your garden with a fall cleanup. And so for a fall cleanup, that usually includes cutting back plants, um, raking the leaves, maybe putting some mulch out, just getting everything nice and neat and tidy for the winter. And so my question to you, if this is something that you're thinking about doing or have already done, 
in your landscape is why are you doing a fall cleanup? Are you doing it because these places told you that it's time to do it, that you personally don't like the looks of things? You know, what is the purpose of your fall cleanup? I really want you to think about that because a lot of times we're doing things just because people have said, this is the time to do it, or this is what your neighbor is doing uh, at the time, or, you know, the advertisers are telling you that this is the time to do something. And so when you're in your garden, whenever you're doing something in your garden, you want to be thoughtful and intentional about what you're doing, because it is probably affecting an area greater than your, you know, personal landscape It's part of the ecosystem. So, um, I was always that person, <laughs> that neighbor. I've always been that neighbor that it has a messier backyard, messier backyard um, or front yard that I did not ever do a fall cleanup. I um, left things go to seed. And so I was, uh, when I lived in North Jersey for a while, I was in a very small property with neighbors very close by and they were all pristine and very neat and tidy. And then there was my yard, which was just a riot of color and different types of plants, diversity and insects and all of that. And so um, I never really concerned myself with what the neighbors were doing. I just knew know how I wanted my yard and how I wanted my yard to benefit the environment. And so I gardened and managed my space differently. So um, in case, in some cases there are rules, you know, there's lawn laws and all that kind of stuff that you have to pay attention to. But um, in a lot of cases, we're just doing something because that's the way that it's always been done, or that's the way we've been told to do it. And it's not necessarily accurate or correct for our situation where we live or, or how we want to manage our property. So, so just something to think about. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. And so um, as we talk about this, one of the first things we're gonna address are the leaves. So our leaves are starting to fall. I've heard that um, fall color is starting early this year. Leaves are starting to drop earlier than usual this year um, in various areas, not just here. But one of the fall tasks that we focus on is cleaning up the leaves. And so, you've probably heard this phrase and I'm gonna encourage it too, is that you should leave the leaves. We want you to leave the leaves. Now, in some cases that can be problematic and we'll talk more about what you can do with the leaves later. But first I wanted to talk about um, why we leave the leaves. So if in the chat, trying to make this interactive, even though it's Zoom, in the chat, if you wanna put a reason why you think we should leave the leaves, that would be great give you a minute or two to do that. Why would we leave the leaves? It's natural mulch, protection for plants and animals. Good. Insects, yes. Great. Let's see what else. Just lazy. <laughs> well, you know, in that case, Sometimes being lazy is, is okay. So um, just gonna give you an idea of the types of animals that live in the leaves. So leaf, the leaf layer, the leaf litter, we call it sometimes, is a habitat. And it's a very important part of a habitat and part of an ecosystem, especially for overwintering. And so um, we wanna consider leaving the leaves. Now, you may it may not be practical to leave the leaves in all parts of your yard. But if you can find areas where the leaves can stay, you can support so much wildlife and so much diversity when so much of it is struggling now because of habitat loss. So things like um, gray tree frogs overwinter in the leaf litter. So this is our, um, this is a, a example of a gray tree frog here hanging out. So they are native to this area and they overwinter in the leaf litter. Wood frogs, which are, are also experiencing some difficulties because of loss of habitat, they overwinter in the leaf litter as well. So we have frogs, salamanders. I don't know how many of you have seen salamanders at your property. Um, I have gray tree frogs in my property and I do know that because when I one year I brought in my house plants from outside of my porch and then when they it came inside and it was warmed up by the wood stove, I all of a sudden heard this little chirping noise 
And sure enough, I had brought in a gray tree frog on one of my house plants right inside. And then I had to figure out what to do with it. But, um, but I have salamanders at home too, and they use the leaf litter. Um, if you have wet, wetter, shadier woods, this is, you'll find them there. This is a four-toed salamander. And then insects, some of you had mentioned insects. So we have um, the golden, this particular insect is so beautiful. This is a goldenrod soldier beetle. And so the beetle doesn't overwinter as, it, as an adult, but the eggs overwinter in the leaf litter. And those eggs and the larva that hatch from them provide food for spiders and beetles early on in the season as well. So, um, so not only are you supporting individuals, but you're supporting habitats and life cycles of other insects and um, members of the ecosystem. So if you, if you take a look through your leaf pile closely, and sometimes I worry about putting all this stuff in here because then people might get freaked out that there's all of these things in the leaves, but they're all important parts of our ecosystem. And um, if any of you have read Doug Tallamy's book, which I probably have mentioned other times in these programs, Bringing Nature Home, um, you know, one of the best ways to support diversity in your landscape to help support our um, our insects, our birds, our mammal populations is by supporting the insect population because after leaves, the insects next feed so many other things. So here we have a black damsel bug and these do overwinter as adults in the leaf litter and they are predators. So they are beneficial insects. So when you are gardening, a lot of times you are experiencing the benefits of having beneficial insects without maybe even realizing it. So a lot of, you might think that you have a lot of bad bugs or problems in your garden, but you would have much, much more if it weren't for beneficial insects around. And so this type of beneficial insect, the damsel bug, eats aphids, true bugs, spider mites, and small caterpillars. So without the beneficial ins insects like this, you could be having a lot more problems in your garden. So leaving the leaves benefits the beneficial insects. A lot of people are familiar with this because it's a, it's a moth and it's a day flying moth. So we often get to see this where most moths fly at night. We often get to see this when um, I worked for a garden center in Chalfont all through college. One of my bosses, I had four, five, six bosses um, called this a flying lobster, the flying lobster moth. But this is real technically the hummingbird clear wing moth. And um, it is a pollinator of many of our native plants. So you'll see this flying from flower to flower on our native plants in the summer, but it's caterpillar feeds on native shrubs like viburnums, which provide food to the birds as they are rearing their young, but the pupa, so the stage, um, you know, one of the stages of the, the moth overwinters as a cocoon in the leaf litter. So the stage between the caterpillar and the moth is overwintering in the leaf litter. So if we clean it all up, we, are, we don't get to see these flying lobsters around so much. This one, I really hesitate to show people because people are really creeped out by spiders, it seems. So this is a thin-legged wolf spider. It does not form a web. They're, they dwell on the ground and they eat insects that are found in the leaf litter. But they, so they overwinter in the leaf litter as well. And here's where you have a bumblebee. And there's many different species of native bees around us, and they have different um, different where places they uh, different ways of making it through the winter. But most bumblebees die, except for the mated queens, as winter closes in. So the only ones that are left alive are those mated queens, and they hibernate in the leaf litter or in abandoned rodent holes. So this is this is the next generation of that of that bee and that beehive. Um, and so you might find them in the leaf litter. And you may find them in things like this. So when you're cutting back your plants, you might not cut them back all the way to the ground. You leave them taller and then bees can um, hibernate or tuck themselves into these hollow tubes. And if you don't like the looks of this in your garden, you can actually take these stalks and then pile them somewhere where the, where the holes are accessible so that the bees can still find their way in. 
there's uh, in North America, there's more than 3,500 species of native bees. And most of them need a place to spend the winter that's protected from the cold and from predators. And so they may use um, a piece of peeling tree bark. They might tuck up in one of these hollow stems of bee balm or sedum like you see here or an ornamental grass. Some spend the winter as an egg or a larva in a burrow in the ground but they are all important pollinators and we need to think about them as we manage our, our fall and winter landscape. When we remove every last overwintering um, site by cutting everything down in the landscape and completely cleaning up the garden in the fall, we're, we're not doing ourselves any favors in protecting the bees. And remember when we talk about protecting bees, honeybees were having trouble, they're non-native, but very valuable pollinators. And of course we all like the honey, but, and the, and the commercial crops that they are carried around to make like almonds and blueberries, but um, it's those native bees that do a, uh, a lot of the pollinating and are picking up where the, um, the European honeybees are falling off. So we, it's really important that we not only protect and garden for and landscape and manage our landscapes for the honeybees, but also for all of our native bee species. So um, I'm going to talk about these. So these are all things that you can find overwintering in the garden. <laughs> Excuse me. I have a remnant cough. I'm trying not to cough, but uh, we'll see if we can make it through. So all of these are can be found overwintering in our leaf litter. And if we clean up our leaves, if we chop our leaves, shred our leaves, we, we, we get rid of them. So let's go through them. So you probably know this guy. This is the woolly bear caterpillar. And um, this eventually turns into the Isabella tiger moth. And this overwinters under the leaf litter. They're one of the first caterpillars to emerge in the spring. And so you might be familiar with that, but you also see them now heading in herds across driveways and bike trails and sidewalks to their overwintering locations. So you'll see them moving in. You'll see lots of them moving around. Of course, the rumor is that the longer the woolly bear's black bands, the longer, colder, snowier, and more severe the winter will be. The wider the middle brown band is a it's associated with a milder upcoming winter. I always look for, I always hope for a solid black woolly bears because I love winter, but um, mo uh, many people are the exact opposite. So they're looking to overwinter. And this is the um, cocoon that they overwinter in. So you can rake your leaves or look through your leaves later in the, in the fall and into the winter. And this is the cocoon that you will find. And this is a, wo a woolly bear cocoon. Not surprising, look how fuzzy it is. And it, so this is what you'd be looking for if you do some activity and you wanna see if I'm telling the truth, you can look for these guys. And of course, when this emerges, this is the Isabella tiger moth. It's so pretty. This is a nighttime flying moth, but just gorgeous. I think moths are the butterflies of the night. Um, they don't get enough credit for how beautiful they are. So I wonder if anybody knows who this is. This is a luna moth caterpillar and the luna moth caterpillar lays its eggs on sweet gum leaves. And so having native sweet gum around, even though people don't like it because of the sweet gum balls, <laughs> excuse me, because of the sweet gum balls that are spiky, I have a picture of them later. Uh, they are very important for this species. If you have sweet gums, you may get these luna moths. So the caterpillars, once it lays its eggs on the sweet gum leaves, the caterpillars eat the leaves until it becomes full size. Then the caterpillar actually wraps a leaf around itself and then uses silk to keep the leaf shut and it creates a cocoon with the pupa inside. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it scared me. It just dropped the Belco doors to the basement. Oh, scared me, okay, I'm good. So here you can see the caterpillar wrapped up, or this is the cocoon now wrapped up in that leaf. Notice how the, the, the leaf is still green. The caterpillar does not silk the leaf to the tree. So this leaf that's silked together around the pupa will still fall to the ground when the tree loses all the rest of its leaves. 
Some other moths will actually attach the leaf with the pupa to the tree, but this, the luna moth, lets it fall. So when the um, so when you have all the fall leaves happening, you'll have this falling to the ground as well, and it overwinters safely in the accumulated leaves below the tree. And of course, if you're not familiar with luna moth, they're just stunning. They don't even look real, right? It looks like somebody's imagination drew this. And so without sweet gums, and if you just keep raking your leaves, we don't have these beautiful luna moths. And we do have these on campus here. Here's another one that overwinters. So this overwinters on those sticks and twigs that we might clean up. So those old um, branches of our perennials, the old stalks of our perennials that we may be cleaning up in the fall, these you may find attached to that. And these are the um, chrysalis of morning cloak butterflies. So morning cloak butterflies are some of the first to emerge in the spring because they overwinter in leaf litter or behind bark as adults. So you may see this in the fall and they may emerge. And then you may find these also in the winter behind pieces of bark or in the leaf litter, because as I said, you they can overwinter as adults as well. This is a morning cloak butterfly. So here we see an oak leaf with a chrysalis on it. And then we have these violets. So these are our native um, blue violets here, which are a native wildflower. And they're the host plant of fritillary butterflies. So without violets in our landscapes and in our, um, in our forests and our woods, we wouldn't have fritillary butterflies. So here you can see the chrysalis. And then here's the, the great, this is a great spangled fritillary butterfly. So they, <laughs> Overwinter as caterpillars um, and chrysalis in the leaf litter. And um, so it's really important by looking at all these things, all of these um, animals that use the leaf litter for protection through the winter, it's, it's important to remember that our garden is more than just decoration for us, that it is part of a system, whether we like it or not, the animals are using it. And so we can choose to support them or we can choose to not support them. And that just um, comes down to the management, plant selection and the management in our landscapes. So, so when we are cleaning up the leaves, there's things that we can think about. So if we wanna leave the leaves, we don't have to, if you're mulching them, right? If you're if you're going to use them as mulch in your garden and you're chopping them up in the mower, you know that's good because they will um, add nutrients and organic material to your garden and slow release fertilizers to your garden, and uh, it's much better than a lot of the synthetic chemicals that you could add or the hardwood mulch that you could use. So it's a great option. But of course, you are chopping up some of those critters that may be in the leaf litter. So what you want to do is use a mixed methods approach to managing your leaves. So rake some and keep them whole and tuck them away in an area that you don't mind having them. If you want to use them for mulch, that's great. Mow some of them with a mulch with a mulching mower and then um you know use them in your landscape as mulch that's fine generally you do want to chop them up a little bit because using whole leaves as mulch does tend to create sometimes an impermeable layer and water can't get through they don't decompose as quickly and some of your plants in your garden may struggle they also may stay too wet under there, but shredding them even just a little will help them decompose faster and act more like a mulch instead of a barrier. So you can do that. Um, another option for leaves, if you have them and you have the space is, uh, if you're a composter, if you really like, if you have composting at your property, like I do, I compost all my kitchen scraps and all my weeds and I have chickens. So all their bedding and all of that stuff goes into the compost. But if you're familiar with composting, you know that um, composting is a, a ratio, a balance between greens and browns. And the browns have the carbon and help neutralize the compost and the greens have all the nitrogen and the moisture. And so you want that good balance. The trouble is in the summer, it's really hard to find browns. You don't have old stems, you don't have fallen leaves, you know, all the things that would normally be browns. 
you don't have. In my case, I have chicken. I use pine chips for the chicken bedding. So I have that brown throughout the year, but a lot of people don't. So um, uh, there was a, the person who used to manage the composting facility at the New York Botanical Garden re recommended just having a space where you store some leaves. So take your leaves from the fall and just put them in a pile. It doesn't have to be in a fence or it could be in a nicer structure than this or just a pile off to the side. But then when you're composting throughout the year, just take some of those leaves through the summer and just throw them in. And then you're getting your browns that you need to balance your compost out. That will help speed up decomposition, make it a better compost product for your garden and um, use your leaves up too. And also you're not chopping up the leaves that any critters that are in there can still thrive and live in there. They can make it out from the pile when they need to. So um, that might be a good, a good way to use them. Here, of course, so a lot of people in the fall, they wanna cut back all of their perennials. And when they stop flowering, hopefully you've been deadheading throughout the season. And so your bloom time has been extended. And then when, they're finished, um, it, people think that it's time to cut these back. And we did look at the reason why you might want to leave your stems there for those chrysalises, chrysalis, I don't know, the chrysalises that might be formed on there by morning cloak but butterflies. And then also the hollow stems that you may be able to use to provide habitat for the bees. So you don't necessarily need to get in there and cut everything back. Um, this kind of messy um, look when the when the plants are done, but are still standing, they're kind of dormant, but, but still standing. They're great protection for animals that otherwise don't have a lot of protection in a winter landscape around here. So that, that thicket-like habitat is not that common in our area. And so that, especially if you feed the birds or something in the winter in your landscape, this provides um, protection for them. Birds are very vulnerable at feeders, so they tend to get some seed and then fly to a protected spot. And so um, birds and other animals can use this for protection for shelter. Of course, this is um, echinacea. These were echinacea. These are echinacea. So here we have a swallowtail on a purple coneflower flower. Here is a uh, tiger swallowtail chrysalis overwilt overwintering as a chrysalis on standing plant material. So this was a um, an echinacea stem that was left in the garden. And here the tiger swallowtail is using it to overwinter. And notice how much this looks like a piece of dormant plant material. And that's of course very intentional. But if you cut all these away, then you lose this in the garden. <laughs> Sorry. So even though we might not like the looks of this so much, um, cutting back your fall perennials, maybe it doesn't need to be on your to-do list for the fall. So when the mums and the pansies start going in, you don't necessarily have to clean all this up. And also, of course, those are seed heads. And there's some birds like this is a goldfinch. There are some birds that really like the seed heads and you can provide food throughout this, throughout winter by um, by by leaving the seed heads up. Now, what do you clean up? What do you focus on in the landscape? So here we have, this is um, Monarda, this is bee balm, and here you can tell it has diseased leaves, it has powdery mildew. So in this case, you do wanna cut these back. The, if you leave these leaves and they fall into the ground, um, that is the inoculation source for next year's powdery mildew problem. So if you clean them all up, that'll help you manage your landscape better the next season. It'll prevent some disease, hopefully. So you want to get those out of there. You don't necessarily even want to compost these. You would just want to get them out of your yard and out of the garden. So you do want to clean up diseased, <coughs> diseased plants. So, of course, in addition to the food, that they provide, there is some ornamental value to plants left in the winter. So leaving them up, you can learn uh, to maybe appreciate that more, the, the, the beauty and dormancy that our 
natural ecosystem has and our native plants provide. If you are gardening with native plants, a lot of native plants, the reason why we do that is to support our ecosystem. And so we, we need to think about what happens in nature with those plants and try to replicate that so that we can support the system that we're in. And these plants stay up through the winter. So uh, another thing a bunch of you mentioned in the chat with what your fall tasks are is pruning. And so many people take to pruning in the fall. So generally, you don't really wanna prune shrubs, trees, herbaceous plants in the fall. Um, you wanna watch the timing on this because what happens if you do this at the right, wrong time, like if you prune in September or even October when the plants are still, they still have their leaves on them, um, it, you can encourage fleshy growth right before the frost and the freezes, which is a terrible idea. So in the fall, what you wanna focus on only is not pruning for size or anything like that. You only wanna prune out diseased, dead, or dangerous wood, and that's it. Uh, there's nothing else that should be pruned in the fall this time of the year. There, there is stuff that should be pruned in the winter when the plants are completely dormant or in the early spring or just after flowering in the spring, but nothing really in the fall. You, Pruning encourages growth. When you cut off a piece of a branch, it, it encourages growth hormones in the plant to send, to, send, um, to send growth hormones to the end of the plant to push new growth. That's what pruning does. And so if you do that at the wrong time, we've accidentally done it here at the Arboretum where we hedged our boxwood hedge at the wrong time. And then it pushed all new growth in October and then it all just froze and turned yellow. And then you had to look at a yellow hedge for the entire winter. So you don't wanna do that. So just disease, dead and dangerous wood in the fall. Wait until plants are completely dormant before you prune anything else. So for flowering shrubs, you may be wondering, and hydrangeas are always a question. Um, and they're, depending on the hydrangea is when you prune them. So different types of hand, hydrangeas get pruned at different times. And there is a chart. That's a really great chart to use. To re, I don't memorize it because I just look at the chart. <laughs> so spring blooming plants, they bloom on old wood. So that's wood that has grown a season already. So those need to be pruned immediately after flowering. So things like forsythia, you prune that immediately after it's finished flowering. If you prune it in the fall, you will cut all of the flower buds off for the following year. So you'd wanna watch that. So that goes for any spring, spring blooming plant. Prune it right after it's done flowering in the spring. Now plants that bloom in the summer, they bloom on new wood, which is the current season's growth. And so those it's best to prune when they're dormant in the late winter or the very early spring before their buds start pushing, before their buds start opening. So, um, those hydrangeas, things like that, you can prune them in the winter when they're dormant. So nothing, again, nothing, no pruning for flowering trees or shrubs in the fall. So if you do wanna do something to help your trees and shrubs in the fall, you can protect your trees from buck rub in the winter. So um, you need to provide, especially in this area, I'm sure all of you have had challenges with deer. Um, with deer in this in this area. And so this is something we have to do around the Arboretum. Anything six inches or less in diameter, a tree that's six inches or less in diameter, the buck really love to rub their antlers on them to get the velvet off of them. And um, when they do that, they can kill a tree because they damage the bark, which of course is the protection for the tree and they can damage it all around, which, um, also damages the growing layer underneath and then the tree just dies because it can't move water and nutrients up and down the tree. So typically this happens, the buck rub happens between September through November, which is during mating season for the deer. And um, usually you're okay taking the protection for the tree off in the beginning of December. We leave ours up, we actually put ours up in August and we take it down in January um, here at the Arboretum. So that's something you definitely can do and should be doing to protect your trees. And ours, uh, what we, you can use, are, there's wraps, there's some people use PVC pipe um, or corrugated pipe. Some, uh, we use little fence, little cages we make out of fencing material on ours. So it just needs to, to provide about four feet up 
um, protection on the bark from the tree. Also, if you really want to get out in the yard and do some stuff, fall is a great time for lawn renovations. If you th think about your lawn as an area rug and not wall-to-wall -wall carpet, um, you can improve these small spaces relatively easy in the fall. You do want to get uh, seating in before Halloween, so you still have time to do it. So you can over, you can spread um, compost over your lawn area. You can rake it, get all, get the thatch out, um, make a nice seed bed. You can put compost over the top of it and then spread seed down. So even in tiny patches, now is a great time to do any lawn renovation that you want to do. Um, by the by, Halloween you want to get uh, everything finished though so you don't want things to go dormant then it's too late if plants are already if plants are dormant already it's too late to begin our plants aren't dormant yet so you also want to figure out of course why the lawn is struggling in the first place and you know deal with any of those issues and then you can put a half inch of compost on the lawn just to work it into the grass to help with give the the um, seed a good nutrient bed to start off in and um, just a good start it also holds more moisture than the, the soil probably would. Also around here we tend to have clayey soils so that will help um, mitigate the clay soils. When um, of course when you mow the grass you want to leave the leave the clippings that also provides nutrients and organic matter to your grass. Um, you can overseed then with, after you do the compost and, um, and then water it in and make sure you still want to keep it watered until, uh, everything starts going dormant. And then it, it will, you'll hopefully see seeds start to grow. It only takes about a week or so, 10 days when it gets cooler for the seeds start to, to grow. We're actually doing that here in the Arboretum now as well. And of course, um, fertilizing you can do and um, weed preventers. So you can do those at this time of the year as well. There are plants that are winter weeds. And so those are, they've actually germinated already. They germinate in August and then they live all through the winter. So you can do some weed control and weeding at this time of the year to prevent those seeding in and starting again next year. If you are a person who uses um, a pre-emergent to stop seeds from growing in your lawn or in your gardens, you often want to apply them in early March or late late February, or early March, and then again in August to prevent the winter weeds from growing. So, um, of course, here's here's some weeds. So this is a perennial weed. This is clover. Again, weeds are just plants you don't want growing someplace. So here you see a bee using this clover for for food. So they can be important pollinator plants, but if they're growing in your yard, maybe you don't like them there, but um, you can also address weeds at this time of the year. Again, understanding what's going on and um, diagnosing it first is really important before you start to overseed, just to make sure that you can be as successful as possible. So another thing that you can do in this time of the year is start dealing with your containers. So you might have container plants, and those, <coughs> man. so those, um, you can overwinter container plants in the containers. That's no problem. Generally, if you want to grow perennials in containers, you want to get perennials that are hardy to two zones colder than where we are now. So we're in zone seven here. So you want to get perennials that are hardy to zone five. They're more cold tolerant and they will um, deal with the freezing of their roots better. You want to use large containers because you want that soil mass around them to protect from the freeze-thaw cycle that these will experience. Um, you can huddle them up for warmth and protect them with bales of hay or bags of leaves around them uh, to, to keep them from uh, freezing and thawing. Basically, it's okay if they freeze. It's not okay if they freeze-thaw, 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 and that's what you're trying to protect them in um, from. In my house, I used to just dig holes in the ground and put them in the ground in the containers and then just pop them up in the spring. So you could do that for protection or you can um, bring them into a shed or a garage and they'll go dormant. They're still alive though. So they will need moisture. If you bring them inside, you'll still need to water them on occasion, maybe like once a month would be fine. They, um, I have 
uh, whiskey barrels, half whiskey barrels for my containers at home. And I have perennials in there, native like sedges and Jacob's Ladder and um, barren wart that overwinter just fine in those without doing anything to them because there's such a big soil mass there. So um, it's basic, again, avoid exposing them to those three, that rapidly fluctuating freeze thaw cycles. The bigger, the better the pots. And then um, you want to put, put the container, you want to plant the container as early as possible. So these this works best with plants like perennials that are in there for the entire season. If you're just trying to overwinter something that just went in in the fall, you might not have the success that you would if this plant had been established in that container over time. And um, wood containers, very durable and um, non-porous containers like concrete, plastic, and metal, they're great for their ability to withstand the elements, but they can be heavy, awkward, and may crack. Plastic pots also might crack with the freeze and thaw and the exposure to um, the sun. So you just wanna be careful of the um, type of container that you use as well. Containers on the north or east side of the house are, are typically more shady. And so they tend to have the least amount of temperature swing, where if you put it on the southern side where you think, well, it's gonna be warmer here, so let me put them over here, that actually has the biggest temperature swing and the, the plants are more likely to struggle there. So if you're gonna overwinter them or even just have them out on display, um, try putting them over on the north or west side of the house instead. And of course, there's plenty of perennials that you can use and even evergreens and dwarf conifers that are fine in containers for years and years. Um, there's less rainfall in winter, so you do have to make sure if they're outside that you do water your pots. And of course, after the temperatures have warmed above freezing and it's not gonna be windy, that's when you wanna to water them. Okay. Oops, sorry. That was just a very quick fast forward. Weeding is something else you can do. As I mentioned, there are winter weeds this time of the year. Um, if And also if you haven't weeded your garden yet and these some of the plants have already gone to seed, if they're annuals, you don't even have to bother pulling them out. The frost is gonna kill them. You, they've already spread their seeds. There's nothing you can do. And you're really just, just let them add organic matter to your landscape at that point. You don't even have to pull them out, right? So it's important you can identify what type of weed it is and then just leave it and because it's already done its thing. At this time of the year, if you grow vegetables, um, have a vegetable garden, or even have an empty space that you're renovating but you're not ready to plant yet, you can put a winter cover crop um, that eventually can be tilled into your garden as green manure. So it's just like adding <laughs> really fresh compost to your landscape. It just stops your soil from eroding in the winter, adds nutrients to it as you're trying to grow new crops. So you can buy pre-made mixes of winter cover crops or green manures, sometimes they're called. Um, it usually has a mix of some kind of winter rye, field peas, rye grass, clover, and vetch that you can mix in there. And so generally you plant these in the late summer and early fall. So you might get, be getting to the end of the appropriate time to plant these at this point, but for future fall or late summer, it's something to think about. This uh, avoiding erosion also helps avoid compaction. So even when rain falls on bare soil, that causes compaction. So by having plants there and then plants that you till in, that helps with compaction also. It also prevents weed seeds from settling in there. It's desirable plants instead of weeds. So there's a lot of reasons for cover crops. Another great thing that you can do this time of the year, if you haven't, is to do a soil test. So soil tests, our great Penn State Extension offers these soil sample bags like you see here. They cost $9 for, for a um, just a regular test. Uh, it costs extra if you want to test for heavy metals or anything like that. But just for a straight standard soil test, you they provide you the bag and you have to fill out a little survey that asks you what you're trying to grow. And then they send you back information about the, the phosphorus, the potassium, the pH 
and um, micronutrients in your soil. And then based on what you said you're trying to grow, it makes recommendations for, for amending your soil. And for, for $9, it gives you a lot of information. And they say you should repeat a soil test every three years, especially if you are amending your soil, if you're adding mulch, if you're changing plants, if you've done construction, any of that kind of stuff, you want to get another soil test done. There's two options for soil tests. There's a specific soil test where if you're just trying to grow in one garden space, you um, just take the soil sample from there. Or if you're just trying to get a gen uh, general idea of what's going on with your soil over your whole property, you can do a representative sample. And so with a representative sample, you take little samples from all over your garden areas, whatever you want tested, you put them all in a bucket, you mix them all together, let them dry out, and then take a sample of that and then put that in the bag and mail it off to Penn State. But it gives you a lot of information that's really helpful for your garden. And it's a lot easier to plant plants for the soil you have than it is to change your soil for the plants you want. Soil is formed over eons and um, it's really hard to change that in any significant way. Any way that you wanna change it, you'll have to continue to do for the entire duration of the life of that garden. So if you can pick plants based on what your existing soil conditions are, it'll be a lot less work and a lot less input in the long run. So but really great $9 to spend. Um, you can also divide spring flowering plants now. So here we have uh, Tiarella blooming. And so that's just one example. But if you have spring flowering plants, you can certainly divide those and move them, <laughs> transplant them around this time of the year. Um, you can make yourself a garden brush pile. All of these, if you don't need kindling like I do, so I covet these twigs for my wood stove because I heat my house with the wood stove. But if you're not doing that, you can create little piles around your yard, even tuck them away in areas that you won't see if you find this unsightly. But this provides cover and habitat for, and it does it year round, for your animals and birds even. Of course, there's late season veggies. Of course, these should be planted in August, not, not right now. It's a little late to plant fall, fall veggies now. But if you plan your garden right, if you start in August, you can have a crop of late season vegetables that, um, and then even some will overwinter, like my collards and kale will overwinter and I can harvest them first thing in the spring. You can pre-seed your veggie patch in, for the spring and you can just put everything out in the fall. And that way, as soon as conditions are right in the spring, all of your plants start to grow. So that is an option as well, but you do have to protect it from the animals eating the seeds. So you wanna do that once it's too cold for them to germinate and then mulch them in and then wait for them to grow. It's better if the ground is continually frozen in this case than freezing and thawing, but um, you will lose some, but you're, you'll have plants that are bigger earlier because they've started as soon as the conditions were right. You may have to protect them from a late frost though. So some, some options for this arugula, uh, lettuce, any of the kale, collards, broccoli, radishes, basil, not basil, don't do basil. And um, those are all great for that preceding. Some, some vegetables here, you see kale, they don't need any protection. They'll do just fine through the winter. You can keep harvesting them or just let them grow and then they'll grow more in the spring and you'll have an early crop of kale. You can do seed collecting in the fall. Of course, you, here's the sweet gum we, I was talking about earlier. The, you can replicate the natural cycle. Plant them in pots outside. If these are native plants, they want to go through winters that are wet and dry. All, you know, that they get snow and then it's dry for a while. They need, and it's cold, so they need that. So you can just leave the seeds outside to go through that natural cycle. Just plant them in soil, in pots, and leave them outside. Very easy to do that. I've done that with pawpaws. Just put them in pots and leave them outside. Um, harvesting, of course, depends on the species, but you can collect them and hold them in a cool, dark place until you're ready to sow them. And then there's, there's tons of different seeds that you can collect this time of the year and then grow them on. And of course, fall is the time for planting. So 
Um, we are doing a ton of planting here at the Arboretum now. There are plants that are not great to plant in the fall. Anything that is a uh, broadleaf evergreen, like this magnolia you see here, or hollies, they don't do great if you plant them in the fall. They're better for spring because of the dry, the dry winds that we get in the winter. But generally, the fall is a great time for planting because if you plant in the spring, the very first season that they're experiencing after that is summer, which tends to have lots of drought, be hot here. If you plant in fall, they go through a winter, then they go through a spring, which is cooler and wet, and they have a lot of time to establish their roots without being too stressed, and then are better set up to handle our summers than um, if you plant in the spring. So just something to think about. You can get your trees and shrubs in this fall. Uh, sweet bag magnolias, birch, and hemlocks all don't do well for planting in the fall. They slow, they're they slow growing and they don't establish roots before the winter freeze. So um, there are different plants that are more suitable for fall planting, but in general, most plants are great for fall planting. And then I just want to remind you that there's a lot of life in the winter garden and come and visit our winter garden. It's so beautiful. Um, and what we do in the fall can help determine the life in the spring garden as well. So we don't have to clear everything out. We don't have to make it this pristine landscape. And by doing that, we can um, support a lot of the diversity around us and make our garden more interesting, I think. And so I will address any questions that were in chat, or if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, let's see. Uh, powder white disease leaves, should we not put them into our township lawn waste cans, rather trash? Generally, yeah, if it's disease, you don't want to spread that. And so you want to dispose of it instead of putting it into the compost pile. Are there any other questions there? Well, I thank you all for joining me again this week and for, the, for coming to the Temple Talks. And um, I hope to see some of you at the Director's Walk or at the Science of Scary or at a future, a future program.